Darrell is the Program Manager of Digital Agriculture with MLA. Darrell began his career in the red meat industry with a focus on robotics and automation in the meat processing sector. He joined Meat and Livestock Australia in 2012, where he now leads programs in automation, objective measurement and digital agriculture. Today, Darrell will be describing the results from a livestock technology trial um, Meat and Livestock Australia conducted at Kawula Pastoral Company in southern New South Wales and also um, at Romani Pastoral. Thanks, Darrell. Welcome, everyone. It's uh, middle of the day. It's always a hard, it's the, what they call it, the hump period. So um, hopefully uh, my presentation um, will uplift everybody. When we're talking this morning, Nathan was talking about what excites us. Um, I know everybody talks about how good their job is, but uh, my job for the last probably 20 years has been looking at advancing technology um, across the, the red meat sector. Um, so my previous role was with CSIRO um, before coming to MLA. Um, I'm not a farmer, I'll just put that up front. I'm an engineer, um, so, but I've been working in the industry for quite a long time. I just want to throw some fast facts up. I always love fast facts. So the global demand for food is growing. We all know that. The world population is on track to reach 9.7 billion by 2050, requiring 70% increase in calories available for consumption. By 2030, the water supply will fall 40% short of meeting global water needs, along with rising energy, labour and nutrient costs. Is increasing environmental pressures, as we all know. Climate change, economic impact, uh, catastrophic weather events, uh, social pressures, uh, more ethical, sustainable farm practices, and higher standards in uh, farm animal welfare, and also the reduced use of uh, chemicals and water. So it should come as no surprise to everybody, those, um, you know, those facts. Um, you can see on the right hand side there some facts about Australia. So this is off the MLA website. It shows you that I've got cattle up here, but sheep are the same. The slaughter cost for Australia compared to the rest of the world. Um, we're four times higher in our labour costs in Australia than we are against our closest competitor, that's Brazil. Um, and on farm costs of finishing cattle are the highest in the world. So we need to do something. What's the future of agriculture? Sensors and data can yield new growth. The entire Australian agricultural supply chain, we have to embrace technology. We've heard a lot about it today, about technology. The agriculture of the early days, is in, it's, it's, it's in the early days of trans transformation and we talk about transformation a lot within MLA. And what is transformation? I'll show you a video shortly that shows what we've done in the lamb sector. Um, and Nathan started it off earlier on showing that video of work that was done around robotics with Scott Technology. Now I've been with MLA and CSRO long enough where we started that program of work. So that automation program that we started, started in 2004. Right? So it's been going for 16 years. The video that Nathan showed you was probably 10 years old. I'll show you the latest one. Um, there's, the industry could track $50 billion in additional revenue. Um, so this is from the McKenzie report, um, by implementing all these things. So in, implementing digital transformation, but you've got to have connectivity infrastructure. So that's one of the important things to note. And we all know that, coming from remote properties, that you know, connectivity is one of our biggest issues. But I'll show you where we've got to in the off-farm sector and where there's a possibility to trend towards, we think it's pie in the sky stuff, and 15 years ago, we never thought we'd get to this stage. Highest levels of food safety and product quality, JBS Australia has developed a reputation as the leading supplier of Australian lamb. Our Brooklyn facility houses a robotic lamb processing system that leads the industry in lamb production. This state-of-the-art system will provide the best possible product for our customers with unrivalled consistency. 
Before entering the processing system, each carcass is hand inspected by the quality assurance team to ensure the product is of the correct standard. A dual energy X-ray then scans each individual carcass to determine its skeletal characteristics. The robot uses this data to precisely cut and dissect each carcass. The advantage to our customer is to ensure absolute consistency, minimum waste and maximum yield on high value cuts. This process also provides our livestock suppliers with valuable data around the fat and bone composition and lean meat yield of the product entering the facility. An advanced 3D scanner also analyzes each forequarter before precision cuts are made. This process is an industry first and again ensures a maximum yield for every cut of meat. The system runs at a consistent and predictable rate at a maximum of 10 carcasses per minute. Production specifications are fully customizable, with the system able to produce square cut or best end shoulders, rack and loin, with rib and flap specifications programmable from 0 to 100 millimetres in length. The rack, chine and feather bone is removed automatically. Loins can remain as pairs or split into singles. Minimal human contact and reduced sawdust means an expanded shelf life, giving our customers maximum time to sell the product. Our commitment to leading the industry in processing technology puts us in front of our competition. Our clients appreciate the reliability and consistency of our lamb processing, and you will know you're getting the best possible meat, service and consistency all the time. So that's where we've got to in lamb. So in every lamb plant, we put currently about 40% of the lamb kill in Australia, about 20 million lambs, goes through that system. So there's 13 systems now internationally um, between Australia and New Zealand that have been developed. And you can see it's come a long way. The, even the blades have changed. We've got circular cutting blades now instead of straight cutting blades. The important thing of this technology is it, re it delivers $7.70 per head increase in value to the processing plants. Um, the other thing that the technology does, you, you mentioned, we mentioned before that it uses DEXA scanning. DEXA is a dual energy X-ray where it can measure body composition. This is really important around, you know, um, previous speakers have spoken about objective measurement and value-based pricing. Um, those systems, compared to current manual method of measuring lean meat yield, that system runs at 96%. The current method of measuring lean meat yield, which is the GR location on a lamb, is 20% accurate. So it shows you how accurate those systems are. I'll show you another video. In Australia, the bulk of lamb producers end up trading lamb largely on the basis of carcass weight. And they can actually vary a great deal in the amount of saleable meat that's in them. So in effect, at retail, they're actually very different in value. DEXA stands for Dual X-ray Absorptiometry. It's using X-rays to determine how much bone, muscle and fat is in a carcass. A measurement that can estimate lean meat yield and keep up with abattoir chain speed. From a binding room perspective, we get a lot of variance in carcass weight and carcass length and those types of things. What DEXA allows us to do is to analyse those carcasses and then tailor the boning room outcomes for saleable meat yield or lean meat yield. Therefore, we can actually choose which carcasses using the cuts based calculator that are suitable for the markets and our customer use out the other end. Apart from running the robots, um, DEXA allows us to give good meaningful feedback to producers. So the, the real value for us with DEXA is the feedback we get to understand that we're we're getting it right on farm. We're not overfeeding our animals. We're not ending up with a fat carcass. That's not good for anyone. It's only not good for the consumers. So what I need is a clear signal about that carcass. And that's what Dexter gives us. Clear feedback about what is the saleable meat yield on every carcass. The holy grail for the meat industry is to really enable producers to be paid for the weight and the eating quality of the meat that consumers buy. If fully implemented, then the combination of objective carcass measurement and robotic cutting has been estimated to produce as much as $420 million per annum of extra value for the industry. And DEXA represents a key component of creating that extra value. Australian sheep meat and lamb is a premium product. So what we need to do 
is make sure that we're focused on producing the right product for so the consumer. It shows you that it's important to get these animals right because the processing plants are able to measure lemon veal yield very accurately. Now why is that important? We all know about fat score two and fat score four. I'm not telling you guys anything in this room here. So these are two carcasses that are exactly the same carcass weight. You'll see on the on the side here, we've got two carcasses. One's a fat score four, one's a fat score two. And we look down here, showing the saleable meat yield of each of those carcasses. Right, so they sold for the same price. The difference in, in, in saleable meat yield was 2.7 kilos between those two carcasses. So when, you, when producers are selling this product to the processing plants and you're trading basically on fat score two and fat score four, you get that same price per kilo. Processing plant is now able to measure the exact amount of saleable meat yield coming out of every one of those carcasses at, six, at a carcass every six seconds. It was mentioned earlier on that eating quality and lean meat yield go in opposite directions. So if you're breeding animals for lean meat yield, you've got to be careful that you're not, you're not hindering your eating quality. So MLA started doing some work around um, CT measurement. CT can actually measure intermuscular fat. Unfortunately, we can't put a medical CT um, in every processing plant. They run basically at melting point, and you can put a human through a CT system about once every half an hour. Um, we did hear that they were doing some work at the back of every airport, so where your bags get scanned at the back of every airport, it goes through a um, aviation spec CT system. They run about our line speed. Now what these things are measuring is explosives and drugs. Right? That's what they measure. They don't measure uh, composition of carcasses. MLA's partnered with this company in America called RapiScan, um, who's about number two in the world around airline spec CT systems. And what we have done is develop those images on this side here. And you can see what that is, is measuring IMF. So MLA is concentrating on not only developing technology that can measure carcass value, but also maintaining the eating quality aspect of it by having an objective measurement technology that can do that. So on farm, what's happening? Is it hype or is it happening? Um, what I'm here to talk about also is engagement that MLA had with two um, producer, producer companies, uh, sorry, um, producers. So it was Car Wheeler Pastoral Company. We, we rolled out that as part of our 2018 AGM, which was in Canberra. In 2019, MLA had the AGM at um, Tamworth. So we engaged with a company there called Romani Pastoral. So it's basically to host and evaluate these various digital technologies that, that you know, we've been hearing coming in the industry that you know, it's been put in to an extent but hasn't really been adopted by industry. Um, we wanted to provide a site where all those installations could be viewed in one location so you could talk to the end user. Um, and some of these technologies that are emerging, that are coming forward, that aren't quite there yet. Um, we also wanted to look at the return on investment um, and the business opportunity, not only for the technology companies that are developing this technology, but also for these businesses that install them. So MLA went out to um, technology suppliers with what we call an open call to see what was out there. Um, this is just a, an overview of Carwilla Pastoral. Um, you can see um, it's, it's situated east of Canberra, north of Yass. Uh, it's got an Angus herd of 900 breeders, um, a ewe flock of 10,000 ewes, 4,000 lambs. Um, they have winter fodder crops, full-time staff of four. Um, you know, it, it ranges from sort of river flats to steep hills. Um, the rainfall, frost period, blah, blah, blah. So that's, car, that's an overview of car wheeler pastoral. Um, Romani Pastoral, um, this is an overview of their, the properties that they own. It's owned by an international banker, um, but run by farm managers, so dedicated farm managers. So you, the properties that we put the technology on was Windy Station and also Garangula near Harden. So they were the two um, parts of their business where we installed the tech.
So this is a list of the tech that we installed on both on, on Romani and Carwula. So the whole list there is what we put on. So we weren't going to do it any half measures in it. We just thought we'd just throw some money at it and see how these things operate in a commercial environment. So I'll just go through some of the some of the tech that we've we've put on. So the water solution. So currently, um, this is, this is from Carwula. So this is data from Carwula. So there was 40 sensors that were installed through different providers. So we just didn't go with one provider. Um, they were monitoring dams, troughs, and tanks. Um, also the river river levels for flood detection. Um, it included a mixture of connectivity from LoRa um, to 3G um, and Sigfox. Um, all the systems seem to work pretty much um, similar to each other. Um, so a normal day um, for the, the um, staff at Carwula were checking five tanks, nine troughs and six dams and 20 water points. Uh, they travelled approximately 14, kilo, 14 kilometres per day taking about an hour to check, and that was seven days a week. So approximately 180 days, and the average cost to run the business is about $110 per run. So about 20K a year was cost them to do that, that um, work um, around the, the water solutions. Um, they've reduced the number of physical checks by 70%, so two water runs per week. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a good cost saving um, to, to the company, um, and it's what we call one of our, um, our, our less complex use cases. So with, with the water monitoring, you, can, you know how many dams you have, you know how long it takes you, how much fuel you use, how much wear you have on your vehicles. So it's quite an easy calculation to work out. Uh, animal tags, we've heard, we've heard some, um, Emily before me talking about tags on, on animals. Um, so the, the chips and body sensors, um, you know, we, we put tags on that measure temperature, pulse, blood pressure, um, and, and other indicators that detected illness um, early, uh, preventing you know, infection through the herd. Um, you know, or, farmers, or, you know, there's already use of air tag technology, um, which, which monitors, you know, those, those um, health also the location, you can see here the movement of the animals around the property. Um, Carwheeler's breeding herd has a thousand cows. Um, they, they track um, their movement with the, with the um, tags. Um, they, they also track the bulls during the joining period, um, which, which you know, according to the, the staff, um, led to significant uh, productivity improvements. Um, so if you, if you just look at um, what they did here at Carwula, um, a 5% increase um, identifying bull issues um, gave them a good return on investment. So you know, it equated to about $3,500 per year improvement in productivity. Our soil probes. Um, so soil probes, we, had, we, we mainly will concentrate with the soil probes at Carwula. They have two 23 hectare centre pivot, ir centre pivot irrigators. Um, so they, they need to understand the weather and soil moisture and match this to the paddock and, and crop, crop requirements. Um, they want a greater accuracy in scheduling their irrigation events. Um, they, their aim was to refine the, the water applications to max this maximise their water efficiency, obviously. So they're able to track the soil moisture. Um, they're looking at the refill points um, for the crop. They can see a rise and fall of the moisture in the profile. Um, they can access how long the decline of the moisture is taking and begin to predict when they'll see um, what, what they'll see in going forward. So the relationship of weather you know, affects the temperature, rainfall, track water use efficiency, uh, so they're using this information to schedule their watering. So they're being proactive, not reactive. So they're, not, they're, they're no longer seeing that water stress in that, in that um, pivot irrigator paddock. 
um, satellite pasture management. Um, so this is some work we did with with SIBO Labs. Um, as, as grazing businesses, you know, we, we constantly need to measure our pastures. Um, we, we're better able to make livestock management decisions when we know what we have in the paddock, of course. Um, so there's, there was considerable time each month spent as, assessing and measuring the pasture. Um, so they need to have a, an objective measurement of that at a lower cost. Um, they were spending, um, Carwoola, spending about six hours per month um, assessing and measuring their pasture. So their cost estimate is about $700 assessment. So it equated to about eight and a half thousand dollars per year. Um, so they only do that now once a month um, at Carwilla. Um, so they, they, they can look at um, these updates on a regular basis. So basically, you know, the, the, the dashboards that they have at Carwilla, um, they very rarely get out and about. They look at all this information as it comes available to them on their dashboards that they have. Um, in, the, in the video time that we have here, they, they've just accessed um, six paddocks, um, connect this to feed budgeting tools, and they have a more, uh, even a more powerful tool. The other project that, that MLA looked at was autonomous vehicles, another area of, of development that we're seeing um, around the world. This is a company um, that provide vehicles to the American Defence Force. Um, so it's an American company called HDT. Um, their vehicle that you see there is, is what they call their, their Hunter Wolf. It's an unmanned vehicle um, that is used by the American military um, to track in front of soldiers with a device on the front, a flaying tool on the front that actually digs up the ground down to about 100 millimetres um, to detect for landmines. So the soldiers walk behind this device. Um, obviously, if it detects a, a landmine, it, it, it explodes it. Um, the soldiers aren't injured. It has a return to base. So if anyone is injured, it doesn't take another soldier out of the out of the equation, they actually just lump them on this and it, it returns home under full GPS control. Um, so this, this device does have full GPS. Um, it's, it's lightweight. Um, you can see we've, we've, we've trialled it. We trialled it herding cattle. Um, it actually has a, 
You see on the left-hand side, it has a drone platform on it. Um, they actually have a tethered drone on it, so this device can run under elect electric or, or diesel operation, so it can go about, I think, a 1,000 kilometres it can run um, under full GPS control. Um, it can put up a tethered drone in the air um, for detecting things like um, wild dogs, um, pests, um, and even looking for you know, um, weeds in paddocks. And this is in the early stages of development. Um, we do have this machine here. You'll see the number 21 on it. Uh, there was 20 of them built for the American Defence Force. We ended up with number 21. Um, so it was a multi, multi-million dollar development by the American Defence Force. And we piggybacked off their investment to get this device. Um, so it'll be displayed at our AGM, oh, sorry, at Beef Australia in Rockhampton this year. So where to now? Um, so if you look at what we did at Carwoola, we did have, MLA had plans that we were going to replicate that investment in future years. So each year we were going to pick a property in a different location in Australia and we were going to roll out the next stage of all those bits of technology to a, a different property. Um, it, it, was, it was highlighted after the last investment we did that we, we were going to take a breath, we are going to pause for a period of time rather than do another investment. Um, one of the things that come out was the diversity and farm size, location, business structure of producer properties across Australia um, and behaviours and appetite to risk um, affects the adoption and uptake of this technology. Um, and it does require further investigation just beyond the technology platforms that we were rolling out. So we've actually learned something from those investments today. Um, some of the risks, this has come out of a report, directly out of a report that we did after the car wheel and Romani insulation. So industry is, industry is reluctant, reluctant to deploy technology due to overstated benefits or readiness claims and or the hardware that is not commercially robust. Um, producers are not aware of the options and benefits of deploying digital solutions within their business and are confused which solution vendor to engage with. I'm sure you all can relate to some of these, these facts. So you know, there's a need to develop targeted value propositions. Um, MLA has just um, completed a project with KPMG and another company called Greenleaf who do our, what we call our cost benefit analysis and our return on investment models. Um, to look at pro different producer segments and their business models for dig digital agriculture and, and based on their diverse needs. Um, part of the next stage of the project, we want to develop an industry-specific spe maturity assessment method um, to support the farms to evaluate their own needs and jobs to be done, uh, considering that feed-forward and feedback process because that's going to be imperative in the future. Uh, the data that you guys get back um, is additionally as important um, as the, the data that's going to feed, feed forward. So around things like lean meat yield and eating quality, how long the animals been in the paddock, the diseases, all the rest of it. Um, so this, this will enable um, to make informed decisions about technology, product and other service options underpinned by these value propositions that we're, that we're carrying out. Um, so, yeah, it, it, and it's based around individual circumstances, like before it's set up the top, farm size, location, business structure, and financial position and attitude to the technology. So all that, we, we, it needs to be accounted for in these models and going forward. So thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate um, everybody coming, and I will welcome any questions. Um, I should just add that uh, we're currently under the Red Meat Wool Growth Program um, and yeah, a partnership between elders and uh, primary industries and regions, uh, setting up the best practice farm down at Struan uh, and Kybe Bowlight. Um, and MLA has co-funded the co-innovation officer down at um, Struan, who will be responsible for the extension of the findings from that farm and some of that um, demonstration of the value proposition that um, Daryl was speaking about. So um, please stay tuned for that. There'll be 
visual tours, uh, virtual tours and so forth developed so that you won't actually have to attend the farm to, to actually be able to see what's happening down there. Um, but are there any questions on what Daryl has shown you today? Daryl, you mentioned at Kawula there was um, a couple of soil moisture probes set up in uh, irrigated situations. But what about dry land situations? And if so, how was that information being used for decision making? Um, yeah, interesting, the, the, the use of the, um, I'll answer it in two ways. At Kawula, it was in the pivoted irrigated paddock. Um, at Romani, it was out in an open paddock. And definitely, we saw um, a better use of it, an application of it in the period pivot irrigator as opposed to what Romani we use in an open paddock because as you know the soil changes between all those different paddocks so the interesting learnings is some of this technology that applies to some farms doesn't apply to other farms and and you know that was a good example at Romani um, that they didn't see a huge amount of value in sticking it in their paddock because it, it changed so much between the different paddocks they had but certainly at Carwoola, they were able to utilise it more effectively. The interesting thing we were talking before, I know um, Emily mentioned that they put one of the sensors up on a star picket. Um, one of the interesting findings is when we got all these technology providers out to, um, it was uh, Romani, they, they installed all their bits of hardware and... Um, one of the providers put a um, soil moisture probe in the middle of a paddock with some bulls and decided they were going to put it on a star picket with just a pretty basic fence around it. Um, part, of, part of the um, learnings for them was that it stopped working, obviously. And um, so we sent them a photo of it and it was the bulls had sort of played with it like a soccer ball around the, around the oval, entangled in all this chicken wire, basically. So we, we stipulated that each of, the, each of the tech that was on the farm had to be enclosed in like rails, cattle rails. Um, but amazing, you have these commercial companies that are out there selling commercial equipment and, and had no idea how to install it on the property. So, you know, some of these learnings that you get are quite funny. Um, and, and they said, well, you, you know, as part of the, the brief, you didn't tell us we had to, you know, um, put any safety gear around the, the sensor. And we said, no, but in the brief it says you have to repair it if it's broken. So you can come back every week and fix it if you like. <laughs> so they soon put up the fence, of course. Here in South Australia, we've got some producer tech groups. We've got ag tech rebates and stuff. And as part of that, we have to put an ag tech adoption plan together. And so I have to sort of consider uh, what our problems we have on farm and what technology we're going to implement to, to fix them. When you worked with those um, farms, and like Kawool is quite a reputable farm in its region, did you sit down with the, with the business owners and work through what their problems were and what te technology you'd be able to find to help alleviate them and then do return on the investment type? Yeah, it, each, as, as we're fi finding out and, and why we did pause, I suppose, the investment was, it was quite different between what we'd put in at Kawula as opposed to what we'd put in at Romani. Um, Kawula had opening and gate closing facility on sensors on their property and of course when we went to Romani they said, well, <laughs> what are we going to do with them? We have cattle grids. And we went, oh, okay, well, yeah, yep. We, we go to the properties and we do talk to them about what we've done in the past and, and just those numbers that I was, so those, those um, figures that I re was reading out, that was from the manager of Carwilla, Darren Price at the time. So we take those figures to the next investment and talk to them about you know, what their preferences are. One of the learnings that we did, an additional learning we had was around the water management, where we went from Carwilla to Romani with the water management. Now water management's a pretty much a given. You know, you can pretty easily calculate out the return on investment based on number of troughs and tanks and driving time. The, the investment that we had at Romani, we engaged with it. They, they have 100 troughs on their property. So we, we 
we said we were going to have 10 providers with 10 troughs each, so we could compare these different providers, which is what we wanted out of it. The problem was it was an absolute pain in the backside for Romani, because they've got all these, they've got, they've got 10 different providers providing um, hardware to each of these troughs. So when one broke down, they've gone, well, who owns this sensor? Like it's, you know, who, and who do I contact? And so, you know, it's not just looking at the return on investment. You have to look at the business case of each of those properties. And yeah, we do discuss it, but in the end they make, they usually make, and even around the, the connectivity, you know, there was a spread between LoRa, um, 3G, um, so we, we look at the, the landscape of the property to look at, you know, what connectivity they need in those different aspects of the business. I think the, uh, it probably demonstrates the importance of really thinking about what you need the technology to achieve within your own business um, and think about what the... Um, doing your research, I guess, as to what each of the um, suppliers do adequately supply and, and, and again, what um, backup service they offer um, yeah. to, to be able to ensure that you can um, uh, make it work for you. Yeah, KPMG is actually building us a, a ROI tool. Um, they, will, they will be displaying that at Beef Australia this year, so it'll, producers can come along and have a play with it. So they can enter data in around uh, water management, pasture management, and livestock management. Um, enter in their data and it'll, you know, their property details, and it'll spit out sort of what the return on investments um, can be. Um, and I should just say, Daryl will also be here all day, yep. and um, also here today is um, our co-innovation officer from the Struan Farm. So if you would like to come and talk about what's happening down at the Best Practice Farm at Struan. Robin um, is your lady, Robin Terry. Um, I guess that the, probably the just touch on the fact that the the farm at Struan is around um, demonstrating that um, tech that is available commercially, um, not so much the blue sky tech. Um, so I guess um, we will have to leave it there, Daryl. We're, we're a bit behind schedule, but um, please join me in thanking Daryl.